Welcome, everyone. I'm Frank Butterfield, Chief Operating Officer for Landmarks Illinois, and we are now live and recording. I'm going to give it just a few minutes to make sure that everyone has had a chance to arrive and check their settings, get their views how they want them to be before we begin today's presentation. Uh, but before uh, we begin, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. Closed captions are available. Uh, for anyone who may need them. If you'd like to be able to read the text, just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the CC closed captions button. And lastly, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the program. So please post your questions in the chat. I think that's all the housekeeping items and we should be just about ready to get started. So good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation. Today's Pre Preservation Snapshots Lecture. Uh, my name is Frank Butterfield, Chief Operating Officer for Landmarks Illinois. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and welcome to those who may be joining for the very first time. If you're not familiar with Landmarks Illinois, we are a statewide historic preservation nonprofit founded in 1971 to help people save places that are important to them and their communities. Our advocacy team works on 150 to 200 projects at any given time, all across the state. And since our founding in 1971, we've helped to save almost 24,000 places. We are glad you joined us today to learn about some of our important ongoing work. And we uh, ask that you please visit our website to see all that Landmarks Illinois has done and is doing to help people save places for people. That's www.landmarks.org. You can also visit our YouTube channel to see other great presentations and projects that Landmarks Illinois is working on. Before starting our program, I'd like to give our dedicated and generous members uh, and supporters a big uh, thank you. Our, in, our impact in communities across the state is a direct result of your contributions to Landmarks Illinois. This includes our generous Preservation Snapshot sponsors, CNH Specialty Craftworks, Jack Corp, and Vinci Hamp Architects, thank you. Their support ensures that we can host these lecture series for you on a regular basis. And also a special thank you to our annual corporate sponsors. We have a remarkable number of companies who support our work at Landmarks Illinois. If you or your company is interested in supporting our work, we would be happy to speak with you. Again, thank you to all of our generous sponsors. And we wanna thank all of you members of Landmarks Illinois who are joining us today. Membership support is essential to our success in advocacy, education, and programs. If you're not currently a member, I hope you'll consider joining us today at landmarks.org. Just a reminder again, if you need the closed captioning, go to the bottom of your screen and click that CC closed captioning button. We are also recording the presentation and it will be uploaded and available on our YouTube channel. Now to our presentation. So. 10 years ago, Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel oversaw the closings of the largest amount of public schools in the city's history, mostly concentrated in black neighborhoods. Chicago Public Schools, CPS, then created a public website that lists the schools that were closed and reports from the, uh, the advisory committee for school repurposing and community development. As advocates for school reuse in 2015, Landmarks Illinois hired new venture advisors to conduct a study to identify closed schools with high potential for food-related reuse based on the condition of its commercial kitchen, ancillary indoor or outdoor space, neighborhood activity, and interested organizations. So that publication that Landmarks, did, Landmarks Illinois did, excuse me, called Opportunities for Food Partners to Reuse Closed CPS Schools is also available on our website, landmarks.org. Um, and that was generously funded by the Alpha Wood Foundation. I'll just put a link to that in the chat for everyone. But now we welcome our, our presenter for today, Paola Aguirre, urban designer and partner at Borderless Studio. Uh, Borderless Studio launched Creative Grounds, an initiative to explore the community and urban role of school grounds after that largest public schools closure in Chicago history. Paola was also recognized as a 2023 Landmarks Illinois influencer at our Preservation Forward event. She's a celebrity and she's in it. Uh, at, because we wanted to highlight her work as she's invested in spatial justice by bringing more people into the preservation process and empowering communities to have a voice in how historic places in their neighborhoods are reimagined. 
So uh, thank you and welcome, Paola, and uh, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, and just bear with me as I always struggle with uh, Zoom. Uh, you know, it's, I, can you see my screen, full screen? Okay, wonderful. That's great. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm super grateful. It's always, um, I always am treated wonderfully by the Landmarks Illinois team. Um, so um, I want to say thank you and thank you everyone who um, is able to join today. Um, I'm very honored. Um, as, as mentioned, my name is Paola Aguirre Serrano. I'm an urban designer and partner at Boreal Studio. We're a studio uh, architecture and um, urban design practice um, with presence in Chicago, um, where I live for 10 years. Um, most recently, we expanded to San Antonio, Texas, um, closer to the US-Mexico border region where I'm originally from. Um, but I wanna frame this um, presentation today in uh, inviting everyone, if you haven't, if you're um, interested in following more of the research that um, also has been done by incredible journalists and researchers. Um, please also um, um, go to the website, uh, the joint website um, that uh, the research that WBZ Chicago and Chicago Sun-Times published this year, um, where they also did an overview of, of an in very intensive research about uh, you know, what happened 10 years after. So, um, I'll mention this at the end, but we were we were recently um, fortunate to interview uh, a couple of people that work in this project. So um, always more resources. The more of us that know about this topic and issue, the better. We all need to be. Um, we we all need to collectively advocate for uh, addressing this issue of unprecedented scale. Um, but I wanna I wanna also mention that um, I wanna frame the word impact um, as something that. We think about how how working in this type of, of issues um, have impact uh, have impacted our practice as well. Um, so what I thought I would do today, um, and I'll 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 go relatively fast through a few slides, but I want you to know more about the work that we do at Boiler Studio because um, we are a consulting uh, practice, as I mentioned. But we are very invested in, in social impact work, uh, so we we kind of keep projects like this. Um, uh, the Creative Grounds Initiative that I also want to talk today about um, as something that we believe as, as investment in our contribution from the design community um, and design advocacy. So I'll tell you a little bit what we do, what, what shapes us as a practice, um, then I'll tell you more extensively about this initiative called Creative Grounds. Um, that has been a journey of over um, six years now um, with, you know, large scale research, but also like an, an actionable, applicable example of how the work that we think we can do can be done in a place. And then lastly, I just have um, a couple of reflections. Um, we thought the milestone of 10 years was a really important um, opportunity to not only make reflections, but also learning how others are um, investing their energy and resources and partnerships in, in addressing um, repurposing of schools um, and neighborhoods. And, um, and also I, I like opening with this quote, uh, because this always these presentations are a great opportunity to frame um, reflections that have strongly shaped um, me as a professional, uh, me as an educator, but also uh, strengthen our commitment as a practice to community service through design to support spatial justice um, and equitable communities. Um, yeah, so um, this is something um, that defines borderless. We, we try to to, to just um, be clear about this ethos or, or trying to bring others on board with this ethos, uh, with define borderless as a mindset, um, not only geographically, uh, but and culturally, but also as a way to constantly think about connections, um, overlaps, and relationships between places, people, institutions, and as a way to design uh, with instead of, of for. Um, and you know, at Borderless, we um, explore creative civic design that addresses the complexity of urban systems and spatial equity by looking at intersections between architecture, urban design, infrastructure, 
landscape planning and community engagement processes, right? This idea of siloing um, doesn't really resonate for us. So that's that's what drives most of the work that we do. Um, and um, it could be, it could look like creative place making, it could look like community planning processes, uh, community design, engagement, anything that is addressing neighborhood development, housing, public space, social infrastructure, public art, uh, and also responding to topics that are relevant for our time, including climate change, cultural resilience. And so during the past um, seven years now, um, uh, we had the opportunity to work with communities and collaborate in, in multiple projects in the Midwest, including Chicago, Kansas City, Detroit, St. Louis, I might be um, forgetting a few, um, well, the East Coast in Providence and Easton and Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, and obviously in, in the US Mexico border region recently, uh, or from the beginning uh, in Brownsville, Texas, and of course my hometown of Chihuahua. I, I get asked a lot where is Chihuahua, so it's 250 miles south, about four hour drive from El Paso, Texas, if you're familiar with that geography. And so um, every project experience um, has made more relevant the need to focus on collaborative frameworks. Um, and that's where we are invested in designing processes um, as, and, and we appreciate that more as, as the process as, as valuable as the final outcome, either as a plan or as a building, every project experience has been an opportunity to advocate for spatial justice and equitable design while cultivating um, design agency. We are designers, that's what it's, the skill set that we bring. So we want everyone to feel um, empowered um, and moved um, with design tools to shape and advocate for their own spaces as well. And so I wanna, I wanna share with this, um, and I'm gonna transition to a brief overview of Creative Grounds, um, now that you learn a little bit more about our practice. Um, this project has been um, has a very special place in my heart. Um, this was, in a way, one of the first projects when you start a practice, and you were like, "What am I going to do?" So, uh, our commitment to social impact drove me, or uh, to understand what what contribution could I make from the design field um, to Chicago as a city, and and that's when I learned about. Um, Chicago Public Schools closing um, massively in 2013. Um, and we initiated um, in our practice this project as a with an idea of like actionable research, community organizing, and civic engagement. But foremost has been a project that leads with the idea of, of, of acting um, with collective imagination to create meaning together to um, make space together. And um, and I wanna read this out loud because we, the designing with is not just an ethos that it's it's allocated randomly. We, we try to stand by it in this case, designing with communities asks from us to take a stand. And, and that stand in this case is to repair the harm caused by racism and to reclaim our collectiveness. This is an issue that it's not gonna be solved by one organization by one firm by one individual is all going to be part of collective work and uh well you're familiar if you're from chicago you're familiar with this view um in uh the south side of chicago the bronzeville neighborhood um we created about three miles south downtown um with our beautiful iconic skyline and at the forefront of the image is the former anthony Overton school sitting on at the intersection of 49th street and indiana avenue um we know too that Chicago is known by being a steel neighborhood and we take pride over the incredible amount of cultural diversity and distinct features um, of these different communities, shaping their identity, social life and expression of the neighborhoods. But we also know that Chicago has been shaped by inequity, racism and segregation. Uh, we haven't talked about it enough in our design community um, and how um, it has impacted health life expectancy and opportunities of community of color. I think pandemic gave us a slap, uh, particularly in the design community to take this um, more, to take more agency um, uh, within um, this topic. Um, and a key outcome of this inequity has been the concentration of black and brown communities in the west and south sides of the city. Um, Chicago's segregation, like many other cities around the US was designed. Um, and implemented through racist policies such as uh, redlining and rest restrictive covenants that have shaped for decades the built environment and neighborhood life of these communities. 
And so when we started doing research about the nearly 50 Chicago public schools that closed in 2013, um, it became clear that the impact of this decades uh, long inequity uh, was being reflected in the fact that the majority of the schools were located in the west and south side of the city, majority of black and brown residents. This research started in 2016, three years after the closings, um, and searching for answers about the why, uh, we found um, that the city of Chicago had justified its massive closure with arguments of budget cuts, under enrollment, and low performance. What was clear was that the closure of the schools was the tip of the iceberg of major inequities impacting the physical and social infrastructure of black and brown neighborhoods. And once more, taking away resources from the communities that needed the most, the need the most investment. And so I like um, quoting Ewan when she says, he writes, it's impossible to get around the fact that the school closure process was racist. Um, and to many, this claim will seem too bold or impossible to prove. How can we know what was in the hearts and minds of those involved since many of all um, certainly care about children and design uh, racial equity. More for reflection. Um, it became clear that the scale of the harm was, uh, the harm caused was unprecedented. Uh, and the energy and effort that were required to address this challenge would need more than traditional planning effort. Three million square feet um, of building space, over a hundred acres of land, across 25 neighborhoods. It was not only the numbers that were striking, it was all these places that, are, that were being deprived of life that became part of the urban scape of these communities. Imagining what it feel to, what it feel like to see this boarded and closed buildings in the heart of neighborhoods. Um, the research and documentation process gave us an opportunity to reflect not only thinking of the buildings themselves, but also all the school grounds, all the outdoor areas surrounding school buildings that once were for students, teachers, staff, and parents. School buildings varied from 20,000 square feet all the way to 250,000 square feet. Um, West Pullman here is kind of closer to uh, 200,000. Um, some of them had been serving their neighborhoods for over 100 years, like this one. Uh, buildings were sold through a public bid process and slowly rolled out for being proposals. This one particularly, by the way, uh, was wonderfully um, redeveloped um, into housing already. Uh, so this is, this is one of the, the few um, um, success stories that we, we, we're hoping continue to track and, and follow um, but at that time, um, you know, with this issue, we, we start imagining not only what would be the next life of the schools, but also how the redevelopment of schools could become an opportunity to revitalize other neighborhood elements and leverage their strategic location and communities. In this image, uh, West Pullman Elementary, which is set back, uh, which means entrance is located on a local street. Um, but it's also adjacent to 119th Street, uh, a main east-west corridor that once uh, was a vibrant, a vibrant commercial street flanked um, with storefronts. And um, although this was initially a self-initiated design, we we're really good at imagining or generating, producing imagery, right, that can help us to convey ideas. Um, the self-initiated design and vision and exercise help us to think about the broader possibilities of the repurposing of the schools and reflect on how uh, could other types of community spaces um, could be created to support neighborhood life and bring visibility to the story of the schools. And so, it's a little bit lagging. Um, and so this all knowledge and just feeling anxiety about not sure what to do, how to act, um, inspired a Creative Grounds. And Creative Grounds, um, it's a multi-year community-led platform dedicated to keep track of the schools and document their transformation, imagining and implementing ways to keep the schools active during the in-between timeline of the redevelopment process and connecting with local efforts and support with design ideas for community-led repurposing. Um, 
I forgot to mention at the beginning, we use our practice. We don't claim to have answers most of the time, but we use our practice mostly to ask questions. So Creative, Clap, uh, Creative Grounds is also a platform dedicated to ask a question around this issue. And because we come from design, um, the question is how might art design and architecture create a more inclusive and equitable process for our closed schools? And um, Creative Grounds was not only a, a way to learn uh, about this issue and, um, and it was not only a critique to the inequity that had become that we had become aware of, it was a way to bring visibility to this issue and creative opportunities for collective discussion and spark imagination about the future of social infrastructure in Chicago. This research uh, has created multiple resources, particularly mapping as a way to understand um, this issue in multiple layers. We think about researching and documenting the schools as an act of resistance. Speaking of preservation, right? Like how do we resist being erased? Uh, that's, an, that's a different approach. Um, it was very clear that the city was not very invested in making it easy to have access to clear and transparent information. So we took the task of inventorying and actively uh, doing this investigative work. Um, I don't have a journalist or research background, so imagine trying to do that without knowing half of the time what you're doing. But I have really good um, friends that were always um, advising and, and you know guiding and being generous and sharing possibilities of doing this work. Um, so Creative Grants was not only, um, um, sorry, another aspect of this work um, guided us to think of this repurposing processes that uh, were, we were imagining as something with an expanded scope. So beyond the adaptive reuse of buildings, which we think is very important, it's very um, energy consuming, we wanted to think of opportunities to keep these places connected with our communities while contributing with renewed spaces for learning, change, gathering, and supporting local entrepreneurship, innovation, social impact design, and primarily restoring public life. The scale of this issue didn't fit a linear process, uh, now that we knew exactly how to work with it linearly. Um, and we created a framework instead of a plan that helps us to try to, um, try to multiply um, forms of sharing, learning, connecting, activating, documenting, and do this in a cyclical effort. Each one of the closed schools has a story that needs to be told and amplified. Uh, we continue to work on that. Uh, the schools witness so much life, love, care. These communities deserve public and civic resources and investment that supports their self-determination. So how do we create support, create and support spaces and processes for these communities to design the future and have an active role in their repurposing? Um, while the overarching research, this is all work that was happening you know, on the desk, um, and this framing was very key for this effort, we also thought it was fundamental to zoom in and demonstrate how all these ideas um, would look like in one of the schools. So we were very fortunate to have connected uh, in 2016 with PM Foreman, the Washington Park Development Group, who bought Overturn in 2015. Uh, and former, if you have not been, please um, visit. We're um, starting recently a construction to improve the outdoor space. Um, uh, former Overton Elementary is located at the corner of Indiana Avenue and 49th Street. The building was designed by Perkins and Will and opened in 1963. The building reflects the influence that modernism was having in public schools in the 60s. Um, after the closing of the school, um, in 2013, one of the first tasks that Chicago Public Schools did was to physically remove the signage with the names of the school. This act of erasure not only left the void with the community fabric, but also removed the historical figure from the neighborhood, in this case, Anthony Overton. Anthony Overton uh, was a business and civic leader in Chicago. Um, Overton moved from Chicago in 19. 11 from Topeka, Kansas, relocating his business, the Overton Hygienic Manufacturing Company. In Chicago, he expanded his business, opened the Douglas National Bank, and founded the Chicago Bee, a prominent newspaper in the Brownsville neighborhood, and became known for its majority female editorial staff, including Ida B. Wells and Ola Dix. His legacy also includes giving this neighborhood the name of Brownsville, also known as the Black Metropolis. 
So speaking of preservation, once more, right? Um, we were inspired in the, by the context in which Overton was built. The 60s were a very influential time, not only featuring key social movements for the United States, but also food and planning, architecture, and neighborhood infrastructure. Schools were at the center of the transformation and had highly influenced by modernism, new technologies, and ideas of the future of education and pedagogy that led to the design of building, of new building typologies and aesthetics. Overton School represents the intersection of many of these elements. And so Overton became this opportunity to prototype community engagement ideas. Lots of outdoor space. Um, we had spent significant time drawing this map, the map that I showed previously uh, with the closed schools location and understanding their um, kind of area of the neighborhoods. Um, and we thought, what if we put the map of Chicago at Overton to put uh, Overton in the, on the map of Chicago? Um, so Chicago Extra Large, which is the name of this piece, it's a 90 by 120 feet map installation on the parking lot at Overton. Um, this piece, this installation, um, started this journey in a way. For the, five, for the past six years, Creative Ground has partnered with Washington Park Development Group and has hosted dozens of collaborative projects um, and connected and engaged hundreds of neighbors, community members, including residents, teachers, students, youth, Dozens of artists and designers in over 50 local and citywide organizations. Let me be clear here and stop. None of the work that we've done um, could have been possible without a lot of people that have invested their energy in transforming a vacant lot, sorry, a vacant parking lot into all this happening. Um, Overton also, Overton School also provided the opportunity to shift from research to activation. While we were documenting and keeping track of the schools, um, you can see that on the top of this image of this um, diagram timeline, multiple studies, reports like the one that Landmark supported, uh, public bids, um, purchases, including the very low prices from the south and west side buildings and redevelopment processes. We also had a chance to test ideas on the ground at Overton for collective activation, and we've done that since 2017. We have invested in the human infrastructure uh, of creating spaces for collaboration, for caring, for belonging, mostly to dream together, to believe it's possible to bring the spaces back to life together. Through Creative Grounds, we have had the opportunity to share the story of Overton with national and international audiences, as this project has been selected multiple times and feature, um, it has been a featured site as part of the Chicago Architecture Biennial, which is also, which had uh, also like a quick plug, it has opened recently. So if you haven't seen the work at the Florida Museum uh, as artistic director helped to curate, uh, please don't miss this winter cold time opportunity to do so. Um, but uh, going back to Overton, it's, it's in this project of Career Grounds, visibility has always been a goal. It all started with a map. Um, uh, this is Chicago Extra Large map that I, that I mentioned, um, the vision of this map installation started um, a lot of this other activities, workshops, um, meetings, um, neighborhood uh, events, you name it, we probably have done it at, at Overton. Um, this is where the, um, the vision of this map installation of Chicago was beyond the drawing. So took the drawing, put in, in a large scale format. And yes, the geographic representation of close schools at close 25 neighborhoods in Chicago was important. Um, but what was most important here, we're at, we asked everyone during this activation of the map that everyone that uh, was at Overton that they stand on top of their neighborhood and then they could recognize or they could locate or identify the, the school, the close school that was closest to the area where they live. But what was most important, um, so you have people here, probably so everyone will know uh, here, we have people here that had never been to Overton and that has been recurrent. Like we keep inviting, putting Overton in the map of the city and, and continue to invite people. 
What uh, was more important was to imagine collectively how this place, the parking lot in the close school in the south side of Chicago, that's just many layers of complexity there, could become a, full, a place full of life again. Um, and um, many of these events continue um, with wonderful partners. Um, and we have had multiple ways and opportunities to just test different topics. And, and um, I'm going to tell a quick story about this installation. This is one of many that we've done, supported in partnership. Uh, so we were commissioned by um, the Center for Neighborhood Technology, asking us to create a demonstration project addressing climate change and cultural resilience. Um, when I think of preservation and progressive preservation, I think how do we how do we connect these places and their identities, um, their importance, their heritage importance with topics that are demanding uh, our attention and action in the 21st century. So for this project, we focus on bringing visibility to this report and the impact of flooding inequity in black and brown communities. Um, the research to design this map installation focused on working on GIS data um, at the urban watershed scale and visualizing the susceptibility of for neighborhood areas to flood based on their level of permeability, as well as create an opportunity to learn about the key role of green infrastructure investments for neighborhood climate resiliency. This was a lot to process, right? How do you bring this knowledge to the community scale? This project including collaborating with Site Design Group, which we continue to collaborate with, um, a landscape architecture practice also based in Chicago, uh, to build a demonstration rain gardens as part of those green infrastructure solutions and um, and, and just inspiring and, 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 and sharing knowledge about um, this type of nature-based solutions. This map installation was not only a technical graphic, um, much more complex to draw than the Chicago map, as you can imagine, but also was a piece for reflection and collective dialogue about climate and cultural resilience with um, the core team um, and also the do dozens of volunteers and neighbors that contributed to this completion. So I think, yeah, I'm gonna play a short video so you can hear from them and I'm, I'm gonna come back in a few minutes. In order to thrive, a community can't be constantly faced with destruction. If our neighborhood is always flooding, their houses are being messed up, their businesses are being messed up. It's impossible to grow when you keep having these setbacks. Chicago has a major flooding issue and that affects the cultural and economic vitality of these neighborhoods. Flooding is generally concentrated in the south and west sides of Chicago, which are predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. So on this parking lot at the Overton building, we've created a large scale map installation. We started off drawing with chalk and spray paint so we could know where to paint and which color to paint with. And we numbered the colors. One is lighter, five is darker. The darker the color is, the more the water is channeled into the actual sewer system. It can overflow, causing flooding to streets, causing backups in people's homes and apartments. It first takes defining it before we can sort of address it and actively change it through green infrastructure. A lot of these former schoolyards and schoolyards actually are 100% asphalt, so we decided what we would do is we would take a portion of that and pull up the asphalt so we would make it permeable. We thought that was a great solution to kind of keeping the stormwater not only on the site, but also developing some learning opportunities in terms of planting rain gardens. So a lot of the plants behind me are wetland plantings, so they take on a lot of moisture. We're channeling a lot of the water that comes off the asphalt right down here into a runnel that filters down into the rain garden. Since 2017, we've been activating Anthony Overton School as part of Creative Grounds Initiative, which is raising awareness about equitable and inclusive ways to transform and repurpose our closed schools. One of the big focuses of this project was to engage in conversation with young people about climate resilience and cultural resilience. Climate resilience has a lot to do with cultural equity just based on the fact of what's properly invested in. Cultural resilience means to me being able to hold on to your roots and traditions. Being strong, like going through tough times and still having a smile on your face, like you know it's hard but you're gonna do it anyway. It's good 
to have cultural resilience. It's good to bring some people in the community together to help out with problems or with projects like this. To me, cultural resilience is bouncing back. It's being able to come back from hard things. And that's something we do. Like, that's something this neighborhood has always done, will continue to do. By doing nothing, nothing's gonna change. We're addressing it head on, calling for the change and being part of that change as well. I hope they learn that how we came together to actually, and that's decide to put this together for everybody to learn about it. Now I'm ready to like, you know, inform more people and try to see more solutions to the problem. just like showing how many people, um, committee members participating. Um, okay. In order. Okay. Um, and so um, just finishing the Overton story here, um, Overton has been a place of learning, growth, connection, and experimentation, a true landscape of collaboration. Hundreds of individuals have left their mark on these grounds. Um, so, you know, it's, it's campus is, is just full of of creativity and and you know and layers. Um, this is um, the collaborative framework at Overton that has enabled it to keep the place connected with its community, while the development team uh, keeps assembling resources and and dollars to reach this complete redevelopment. Um, I forgot to mention the the school is um, planned to become the Overton Center for Excellence, which is a place um, that will. Uh, house multiple organizations um, with uh, business, um, technology, design, um, incubation, and creativity. And um, I'm, I'm currently working on a few things. Um, uh, we're working on a few things, uh, collaborating on a few things. Uh, one is a book. We want to tell the story. Um, uh, we want to be able to share these ideas, uh, but also um, the how to get some of these things done. Um, that's the question I get often. Um, but also, what are the guiding values and frameworks, lessons learned, and possibilities for this approach? Um, for us, for me particularly, uh, a goal is to um, identify policy recommendations to the city. Um, since 2023 has been 10 years since the closing. Um, and so we're always looking for collaboration. <laughs> I don't know what to look at that. Um, but then this last part, I just want to, um, I want to share, you know, we, we've been learning so much about this on the ground, right? Like designing with communities just creates collaborative frameworks um, inherently and, and, and helps us to harness and cultivate collective power. As I mentioned, none of this work um, could have been done alone. And then when we, um, when we were reflecting on this year um, and, and the 10 years, we were, we were thinking, well, Others might, must have stories that we need to share. So um, we're, we're currently working um, in a documentary, do, documentary film um, that um, it's, it's, it's telling the story of the closings after 10 years. What have we learned? Why, why happened? I, I don't think I would like to see more of the conversation in Chicago to continue. Um, and it just kind of, you know, disappears and deems. So like, we really want to bring it back with the idea of, of, you know, how do we prepare best for, uh, you know, additional closings. Uh, we had after a moratorium and and that um, of five years of Chicago Public Schools put into closing any schools in 2018, the first thing that happened was the closing of additional four schools in Englewood. So this is, this is an issue that is not going away anytime soon, but, more sort of think like the if it's gonna happen, like how how do we want it to happen as community? You know, how can we have a say in that process? And how do we, you know, think actively and proactively about you know the structures now have been the ones that haven't been sold, um, are just very hard to <laughs> redevelop. Like the for maintenance is takes a very high toll in 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 the structuring of financing for the structures. Um, so three case studies, Overton School, of course, becoming the Overton Center for Excellence, which we know everything about or everything that needs to be known. 
Well, we venture to um, learn about Woods Academy and the Wood Generator uh, in Inglewood um, and also Emmett School um, in the West Side um, as to, to become the Aspire Center for Workshop Innovation. So if you don't know about these projects, um, I invite you to, you know, there's 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 news that being shared constantly. But what was interesting to for us to think about um, in this research um, was at Overton, um, the partnership between Washington Park Development Group and, and Borderless as just, you know, like thinking of the hardware, right? Like how do we bring the building back? And also um, how do we keep the space active and connected um, has led to all this wonderful um, programming and, and, and activities. We, re we are most recently, um, we, we are in the middle of construction for, um, we were awarded one of the public outdoor plaza grants um, by the Department of Planning um, that was funded by the recovery um, resources. So um, stay tuned, spring 2024, we're gonna reopen these grounds um, with um, improved landscape um, design and some of the elements that we've been just working with, you know, temporary um, materials and donations and, and whatnot. So. Um, you all invited, uh, just follow us in, in the Creative Grounds website for our newsletter and after that plug. Um, but also, um, you know, that led us to reach out to uh, folks with um, working with um, in the Woods Academy building. Um, this is, this was fascinating because the former um, Granville T. Woods Academy located on Racine Avenue between 63rd and 62nd. Um, is being imagined um, as a hub uh, called the name of a generator for supportive housing, health, and wellness, um, and reentry services. So the word regenerator was very important to like rename, reimagine, rename um, a place, um, which is a different approach that we've been doing at Overton, where we wanted to highlight the identity of Anthony Overton as his name. Um, character um, and community community um, member. Um, and here's, no, let's give a new identity to the school. Uh, and this also has a mixed use development um, uh, with housing and business incubator. So um, that is an interesting partnership. Um, the group that had been working already in, um, in the, the campaign and the project Go Green on Racine, um, created uh, an entity to become developers, right? Like Go Green Development Group is integrates a partnership between four organizations. It's Iman, it's Rage, it's Teamwork Inglewood, it's EG Wood, but just as proves the case, right? Like none of these organizations are necessarily developers. Only EG Wood has kind of that specific expertise, but they had to figure out and they are being successful and they got funding, financing secure for this project that is around the $25 million. So these buildings are not um, cheap to bring back. That's another key observation. Um, and then the other, the other case study that we are um, just looking more into is uh, Emmett School and a school within the West Side uh, to become the Aspire Center for Workshop uh, for Workforce Innovation. Um, this is located on West Madison at the intersection, which is an amazing site to um, the intersection of Madison and Central Avenue in um, in Austin. Um, very important streets, very important location. I can't we really talk about this. Um, but this is also an incredible partnership um, between um, Austin coming together, um, a neighborhood um, organization that uh, led much of the development of the quality of life plan for Austin called Austin Forward Together in partnership with Westside Health Authority. So an organization, two organizations coming together to figure it out again, right? Like how do we, how do we think of the space to be of service of the community, but also this is a building that was built in early 20th century, 1913, um, and um, also has, um, you know, it's the large scale, right? Um, so 
how do we, <laughs> what are the stories behind the amount, tremendous uh, energy that is required to figure out the financing in, in this, and particularly this one, the committee engagement as well. The two, the three projects, the committee engagement aspect is just remarkable. Um, how the accountability, right? Like when, when the, when, when the, when the development redevelopment of this building is done by local organizations, uh, local groups, the accountability is, is is very high, right? Our are your neighbors. They're asking you. Um, so the the techniques that um, and the the methodologies and the commitments and, and engagement from these different projects are are something to to look to look up. So I don't want to give a lot of um, before, but um, again, we're working on it. So um, you'll 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 have to. Stay tuned. Um, we're still summarizing a lot of notes. We completed a lot of this interviews this summer. Um, but a, a few key reflections just before I, I move into the questions and answers that are bringing this research. Um, it's you know these three questions basically: who gets to decide how cool schools um, are repurposed, and you know that just brings aspects of equity, inclusion, with presentation, justice. Um, Again, confronting the, you know, how the process was done at the beginning, the large scale, but then how it has manifested and evolved into, okay, city of Chicago is not, doesn't have the capacity to respond or like it's not being accountable to respond to this issue. Uh, community organizations are stepping in, stepping up. Um, then how do we, how do we find a way to support? Like I, I forgot to mention, this is a plus $40 million project as well, right? So. These are, yes, we closed the schools because there was a budget crisis, but the dollars still needed to bring these buildings back. So how do we think more creatively around that? Um, how can repurposing school ideas be supported, advocated, invest, advocated for, invested in, so that that reaches to the issue of policy, right? It's essential scale, essential policy, but how do we find frameworks and how do we think of institutions, uh, partnerships, um, that can help with that um, scale of development and redevelopment. And then lastly, if the inequities that we experience today were divine, uh, what is our role from whatever, whatever perch you are uh, to repair the harm and imagine collectively what equitable communities look like? So either if it's partnering, if it, either if it's from research, from a form of alliance, what are the systems that need to be addressed? I know these are broad questions, but they, they help us to frame a little bit our, our, our work and our efforts, even though we're doing things on the ground and like doing outdoor improvements. Like we, we think, how can we take all these lessons and learnings um, from everyone who's working on this um, into this, the, the, the scale of or the, the level of policy, right? Like what do these communities need to, um, to just tackle and address a problem of this scale. And so, um, yes, documentary, stay tuned, uh, spring of 2024, uh, we're partnering with our wonderful friends from On The Real Film um, to, we have we have an amazing amount of conversations and knowledge that these folks share. So everyone who has been involved in these three projects has um, shared with, with us a lot of Good insights. Um, thank you, Phil Foundation, for funding um, this project. And um, you know, I I know I went a little bit over, but um, perhaps I just um, have a we have time for a few questions. We do. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. I mean, it's really engaging, important work. So I know there's a lot to talk about. Uh, there is a question here, um, uh, which I think prompts additional questions about. How many buildings, how many of the schools were considered not worth saving, preserving, and are most just empty now? Which I think, again, leads to the question of like, who decide, like, uh, according to whom are they not worth saving, preserving? But what are your reflections on that? Yeah, um, that's a good reflection. So, um, and that's a difficult criteria, right? Because if you ask every community, like, is it worth saving? They're going to say yes, right? Um, but I, I think... You know, I want to go to the um, the the numbers of like that I'm most familiar with are like the the ones with how many schools were repurposed. But I think it's a different question. So I I know um, 
I think Burnham, there are a few that have been demolished. You know, that's not a surprise. I think Burnham was demolished. Um, but many of them, so it's interesting, like the buildings, there's a lot of early 20th century buildings that are really beautiful, like the West Pullman, right? The, those inevitably, you know, we want to save those buildings because of their historic character and aesthetic. Um, but also, you know, things like, or, or like Emmet, right? They're the same kind of aesthetic. Um, and, you know, there are buildings um, like... Leland, which is a tiny 20,000 square feet next to like very close, it, also in Austin, that it looks like a, you know, like a shoebox, right? But like, that doesn't matter, like that, that, that could be invested in, I think it was, it was, um, it was purchased by a local organization offering um, programming, after school programming for kids. And they had, when I went talk to them, oof, I think it's been four or five years, they had 20,000 ideas, right? Or how this place could be reimagined and redesigned and whatnot. So um, many of those were about, you know, utilizing the outdoor spaces, which I think that's where I've been, I've been a really big advocate. Um, so I also want to acknowledge there's a lot of work and thanks Elizabeth, um, that has been done. So I'm not the, the sole like holder of knowledge. I think, you know, between the piece that Elizabeth did for math context, uh, Elizabeth should put the the link in the in the chat um, and um, the research that um, uh, you know um, Sun Times and WBZ team did. Um, there's just a wealth of knowledge, right? Like the question is like, where is the what what are the lessons for action to be taken, and what can be translated to policy? Because the city has a big role here; it could have a big role, right? And and supporting. Um, those that locally want to take on this major task. Thank you for that. Um, I'll just note a comment here from uh, Gian Foreman saying that working with Paula has been wonderful. It's helped me as a developer think about the development process in a different way. So I appreciate very much that that comment. There's also uh, a question about uh, how the, uh, the economic impact in the neighborhood around Overton, has it drawn new investment in business and development? Good question. I mean, Brownsville is changing dramatically, right? But I would say, um, I, you know, we interviewed Alden from um, WBZ team. He's a data person, very seriously, rigorously has documented particularly this, the economic impact and the footprint of neighborhoods. So I'll get back to you on that. I was still trying to figure out how to synthesize a lot of that information that comes from data and also from comparing, right? It's, it's a lot of comparison. Uh, of data around, um, but I would say particularly Bronzeville, um, the transformation of Bronzeville recently, um, it has many factors, but I, I would say, you know, there's 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 definitely data driven um, information that we would like to share as part of our, our effort of sharing next, next year, this um, findings. Thank you so much. Um, and then uh, just to uh, note on your, your previous comment, I did drop in earlier the um, oh, the piece okay. that Elizabeth did for Mass Context, which is excellent. Okay. So the link is there. Hopefully it works for everybody. Please go and bookmark that for reading if you haven't seen that already. Uh, Elizabeth also um, uh, dropped an, a note in the, the chat basically saying that she had heard that there was a um, an order for uh, a stoppage of sales of the schools by uh, under uh, previous mayor Lightfoot. Do you, do you have any intel on whether that such a stoppage is still in effect or or what the status is? Uh, good question. I do not. Um, I think you know it's early. Yeah, I remember the stop for a few buildings that you know needed a. Let me say this. Let me think how to say this. Um, that had a strict strategic kind of role. I'm gonna name like Fisk and Woodlawn. Also Woodlawn is still going through a lot of changes, right? So um, there's major pieces of social infrastructure, cultural infrastructure being built in the neighborhood. So they wanted to hold to a few pieces, um, not not sure. And then, you know, we, we have a whole rehaul of the Board of Education <laughs> um, coming, right, from, um, appointed um, 
board members to elected board members. So there's a lot of changes and also, you know, a new appointed um, president of the board. So like there's a lot of things that are changing in the landscape of managing these assets. Um, but um, no, I do not know. I would like to know so if you find out, um, let me know. I've been, I've been a little bit in the woods of interviewing people in the three case studies, but um, definitely um, I would be curious. Thank you for that. Um, I'll note uh, uh, Paula had a comment about the uh, immediate migrant housing crisis and you know trying to uh, have these as a resource uh, is for the, that immediate need for multi-use lifestyle centers. Um, so just a comment there. There's also a, a question about capacity. Um, you know, a lot of schools are operating at low capacity, some as low as five percent. Um, uh, is is you know what's your position on should any of these should they be closed essentially, or or um, how do we decide about capacity versus opening and closing? Well, it was interesting. Um, you know, I was I was reflecting on this because it's it's not a question of if, right? Like this facility facility assessment happens no matter what, right? And there's going to be shifts in or like assessment and capacity um, efficiency and other whatever criteria that gets put into the mix. But I think I think that the 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 item that we're trying to raise is that it's not the if we know that's going to happen no matter what like neighborhoods change neighborhoods change their populations people move um you know particularly the displacement of a lot of black and brown residents is just completely throwing off board the numbers and enrollment in schools so like that's not an if that's going to happen it's more the how and how do we decide how that's where that's the question that I'm interested in and like how do we build tables where everyone is included and we need both we need the leadership that is local that is knowledgeable that is you know that they they they're able to what they want in the community um level but also we need the leadership of our elected officials so we it's not either or it's both right so how do we build the tables to make those decisions collectively and also you know this idea of self-determination is not a um it's very present like the three case studies that I mentioned are local efforts that are taking on this almost impossible projects right um because they believe that's possible but they shouldn't be doing this without any support real support that comes from you know the the agencies that, or like they are the agencies that cause the harm in the first place right so it's not like okay off you go it's more like how do you actually if, if you come to the city with, you know, the idea of like, hey, I have this partners, I have this potential use, the, the response from the city should be, how can I help? Instead of, mm, I don't know if you can make it happen, you know, like that, and that should not be an option, that should be policy. Uh, thank you so much for, for that. Uh, I need to move to our, our closing at the time, but just to note that uh, I, I love that point there about, you know, uh, what the responsibilities of our elected officials are. Uh, but meanwhile, I, I want to say how lucky uh, we are to have thought leaders and uh, people taking action such as, as yourself, Paula. So thank you so much for that presentation and the, the Q&A. Um, I also want to give a, a big thanks to our, our programs manager, Layla Wills, for, for putting this together. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed today's Preservation Snapshots lecture on school closing and their impact 10 years later. This was actually our, our last lecture of 2023, so it's hard to believe that we're already approaching the, the end of the calendar year. Uh, but a couple of things I just uh, want to highlight quickly. Um, beginning December 4th, Landmarks Illinois will accept nominations for our 2024 list of the most endangered historic places in Illinois. The annual list of most endangered places is our longest running advocacy program that calls attention to historic and culturally significant sites across the state that are threatened with deterioration, demolition, or inappropriate development. Anyone can nominate a site to the list. And uh, we really look for sites that are that have demonstrated support by local residents and celebrate local history or culture. So look out for that nomination form on our website at landmarks.org uh, coming December 4th and nominations will close January 12th. Um, if you'd like to support Landmarks Illinois, we're looking for members and donors to help us continue helping people to save places. So if you'd like to sponsor the Snapshot Lecture Series or some of our other initiatives, we have opportunities. So please get in touch with us. 
Our staff's information is on the website and we're happy to talk to you about these opportunities. So thank you so much, Paula and to Layla, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a great rest of the year and we'll see you all again soon. Take care, bye-bye.